looks like I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's recording. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, Anthony Bearden here. I am the Horticulture Small Farms Extension Agent in Johnson County. Uh, today, we're talking about cool cabbage and crisp kale. So let's see if I can advance my slides here. Uh, as far as publications go with this, I always recommend the Kansas Garden Guide. If you've got any questions relating to really any crop that you can grow in Kansas, um, this is the publication to look at. Uh, cabbage can be found on page 141, and kale can be found on page 154. So why cabbage and kale? Why do we choose these two to talk about for this presentation? Well, uh, they are both very early spring crops. They are both very cold hardy and frost tolerant. And they are cousins to each other, so it makes sense to talk about them, because as you'll see as I get further on in these slides, there's a lot of similarities in their care. Um, they interact similarly with the environment as well. So let's talk about cabbage first. There are actually two different types of cabbage um, when we refer to cabbage. There's the heading type that we see in grocery stores a lot, um, which is typically green or red varieties. But there's also Chinese cabbage, which is more of an oblong shape. Um, and there's both a heading type and a leafy type. So if you have the oblong um, shape, it's going to be generally green or light green. The leafy type, it can be purple or it can be uh, green. And the leafy type is actually bok choy. So um, if you're wondering <laughs> if bok choy is a, technically a different plant from cabbage, well, kind of, but it's, it's a cabbage essentially. There's also pak choy, um, and if you're wondering what the difference between pak choy and bok choy is, um, pak choy is what British people call it. It's the same thing. <laughs> so cabbage is very cold tolerant and frost tolerant. It can generally handle temperatures down to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So you want to plant it in late March to early April outside or late July to early August. Typically when it's planted outside, it's planted from plug size. So um, if you are planting it from seeds, um, you'll need to account for that as well. And we'll talk about that in a slide coming up. Uh, there are some uh, requirements when it comes to development as well. Um, it is a big plant. It takes a long time for that head to form. So depending on variety, it can be anywhere from 70 days to 180 days uh, for that head. Um, and if you're doing the math, 180 days is six months. So if you've got a variety that is growing an absolutely massive head of cabbage, it is possible to grow it, but it's going to need very accommodating weather conditions because cabbage is a cool season crop. It likes colder weather. It likes colder soil. So if you've got it trying to grow in the middle of summer, uh, it may not be growing the best for you. Bok choy, since it's a smaller plant and it's leafy, uh, generally only takes 45 to 60 days to get to size. So as I mentioned, you can also grow from seed, but there is some um, adjustments that you need to do with that. So you need to start your plugs indoors in February. So right now you can still get by starting your seeds indoors or start them in June so they can be planted in July for a fall crop. Uh, when you are planting them outside, you want to space them 12 to 18 inches apart. So about a foot to a foot and a half. Uh, and you want to look again to the grown, full grown size of the variety. So some varieties are going to stay a little bit more compact. Some varieties are going to get absolutely huge. You need to remember that while compaction is possible, it's going to make gardening more difficult for you because uh, the closer these plants are growing to, to each other, the more the pests and the disease pressure is going to be amplified. The pests are going to have a lot more areas to hide. The disease is going to be more easily spread. Uh, and then just general maintenance and treating those is going to be a lot more difficult because you've got to get between all those plants. So when it comes to the care for cabbage, you want to start with a starter fertilizer. Um, a starter fertilizer is generally just a low range, slow release. So something like a 13, 13, 13, um, you know, your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, you're getting them all those general macronutrients. Um, or you can go with soil test recommendations, which is more recommended because it's going to give you the exact nutrients that you need. Uh, and then every two to three weeks while it's grow growing, you're also going to be, want to be doing side dressing, which is essentially fertilizing with high nitrogen because this is a plant that is a leafy green. It takes a lot of nitrogen to get to size. So something like urea, which is a 4600, um, is, is uh, recommended for that nitrogen. You want to be careful when cultivating the soil. So cultivating is something we do to maintain um, 
the weed growth that may be around these plants. So you're severing the roots of those weeds as you cultivate. But also, uh, cows just have shallow roots. So you don't want to be digging down while you're doing this because you could be damaging the plants themselves. Extra water with this plant is going to be most important once the heads start to develop. So that is when the plant is going to be moving the most amounts of nutrients to the head itself, to the crop. And that is when you're going to need to be getting it lots of water so that those nutrients can get to the head. When it comes to harvesting cabbage, um, when you have the head types, you are going to be looking for firmness and leaf compaction. So if you can press on that head and it is soft, then it is not ready yet. If it is very solid, like a baseball or something on those lines, but larger, obviously, um, then you would want to, to be harvesting it. Um, if you don't harvest it soon enough, you can have an issue called head splitting, where essentially it's become too firm and the, the entire head of the cabbage is starting to break apart. Um, again, with Chinese cabbages, you just want them to be large and solid if they are a heading type. If it's a leafy type, three inches is the minimum that we recommend. But um, it is a leafy grain, so you can pick them essentially as desired. You can let them grow very large, or you can keep them at three inches. Now shifting over to kale. Kale is even more cold tolerant than cabbages. It can handle sub-zero temperatures sometimes, depending on the variety. Um, you want to plant this by direct sowing it into the ground. You can plant it in mid-March, so right around the corner, very beginning of the growing season. Or if you're aiming for a fall crop, uh, you can plant in early August. Uh, depending on the variety, it can be quite heat tolerant as well. And we'll talk about the varieties that are good for that. But uh, this will produce well into the summer, depending on the variety and the location. And what I mean by that is you need to have a uh, summer that's accommodating weather-wise to kind of keep it going. Uh, it can become very bitter if it's too warm and hot outside or too hot and dry outside. So um, definitely, if, if you've got a more mild summer, your kale is going to perform better. Uh, it will have a stronger, more concentrated flavor with hotter weather, as I just said. Uh Numerous varieties are also available. So they vary in color, they vary in flavor, uh, heat and cold tolerance and pest and disease tolerance amongst many other things. So uh, just a couple examples here, you can see the purple and the green. Those are just some color variations. And talking more about the varieties, three of the main types you're going to see out uh, on the market, you're going to have your flat leaf kale, your curly kale and your lacinato kale. Flat leaf, very smooth, um, no real like defined edges to them, as you can see up top. The curly kale is then the exact opposite of that, very fringed and frilly. And then on the bottom, you've got the lacinato kale, which almost has a leathery texture to it. Um, and it almost performs like leather, as we'll talk about in this next slide, uh, when it comes to its, its endurance and the environment. So when you are choosing your kale variety, um, all of them actually perform well in Kansas uh, in the spring and the fall. So it can really come down to what you're going to do with it. If you're going to use it as a salad grain, as if you're going to cook it, if you're going to um, use it in a certain type of recipe, uh, selecting the variety comes down to intended use. So dinosaur kale is uh, lacinato kale. It's the same thing. It's also known as Tuscan kale. Uh, and this kale is very popular, especially right now, because it has incredible heat tolerance. We grew this in the Sunset Garden, which is a community garden that we um, help run with extension. And this performed well into July last year, even with the 90 degree heat. Uh, great heat tolerance, great flavor, lots of longevity. Um, it produces a lot of leaves as well. It, the plant itself probably got five or six feet, well, not six feet, probably about five feet tall. Um, and it's very, very easy to grow. So when it comes to spacing your kale, you want to sow your seeds about a quarter to a half inch deep, uh, thin them to one seedling about every foot. Uh, and this is just going to give the ultimate size of the plants enough space to grow or fill in. Uh, rows can then be up to 15 inches apart. So uh, they can be somewhat compact, but again, you wanna leave that space for, for maintenance and to uh, inhibit pest pressure. Um, you can also grow your plants closer if you are aiming for 
uh, salad crops. So the thing with kale is that uh, it doesn't have to be grown to full size, right? It's pretty much edible at any point. Um, so if you are aiming for salad leaves, you can grow smaller plants and grow the plants closer together. When it comes to care for kale, <laughs> Try saying that fast. Um, it can uh, not really be tricky, but there are some aspects to keep in mind. So consistent moisture is going to be essential. Um, it's a leaf crop, so every single stage of growth is going to need uh, ample water because all that, all the nutrients are going to the leaves, right? So every stage, it's producing the crop. Uh, you want to mulch to maintain soil moisture and temperature. So mulch is going to essentially keep the soil and the moist soil moisture in. Uh, the ground longer, and it's going to moderate temperatures. Uh, so that summer heat is going to uh, not affect the roots of the plant as much. Kale is a plant that very much appreciates a colder soil. So cool and moist with mulching is really ideal. Uh, Resow in the fall if the plants become bitter. So as much as we try to stave off, you know, the effects of summer, uh, the heat will come, and so will the dryness, and eventually your plants just may become bitter. So you can reap sow them in the fall to account for that. Uh, and row covers can also be utilized to reduce inside pressure. You can see that in the photo here on the right. Um, the one thing to keep in mind with this is that you want a row cover that's still going to allow plenty of light to come through. That is a leafy grain. It needs to photosynthesize. So you want all that light to be um, still accessing the plant. When it comes to harvesting kale, you are supposed to hold the leaves from the bottom up, and that is how you keep the plants regenerating and continuing to grow without harming it. Um, we had mentioned the lacinato or slash dinosaur kale. That is in the background of that photo, and then we have our curly kale up front. Uh, again, you're just pulling those leaves from the bottom, and you're allowing it to keep grow up, growing up top, uh, and that gives you a continuous crop. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that the older the leaves get, they are going to lose their turgidity or how they're how firm they are, and their quality and their size is going to decrease. They're probably going to have some like sunburn or insects munching on it at some point. So uh, it's better to get them while they're younger to medium age than old age. So now we're going to talk about some commonalities. As we mentioned. Um, cabbage and kale, very similar plants. They're related to each other. So there's a lot of care that is uh, essentially the same for them. So when it comes to both of them, they require full sun and moderate warmth. Uh, six to eight hours of direct sunlight is, day is full sun. And then the perfect um, temperature to grow these in is ideally 60 to 7 degrees, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they grow best in colder weather. Uh, cabbage, however, can um, increase in growth if you were to warm up the soil. So that is something to keep in mind if you're trying to push growth on it. When it comes to soil and water, they want well-draining soil that's high in organic matter and fertile. The perfect pH is 6.0 to 7.5. So that's pretty standard for your vegetables. Uh, and then consistent moisture, which just, again, means uh, wet but not overly saturated. So if you can take a handful of soil and literally squeeze water out of it, there's too much water there. Uh, a good indicator to know if you're getting enough moisture to your plants is to look up the uh, root zones and how deep the roots get. And then if you could take a soil probe and just poke it into the ground and uh, essentially get to that depth of roots, then that means that your soil is moist enough um, or has enough moisture uh, to sustain that plant. And again, mulching to aid uniformity is going to help with your, your soil moisture. Crop rotation is also going to be very vital with this. So broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards, kale, and turnips are all within the mustard family. So if any of them have been planted in an area within the last three to four years, that means that pests and diseases in that area can persist over growing seasons. So if you are trying to rotate your crops to prevent uh, pest pressure, then you need to keep in mind um, anything where these crops have been growing, or this list that I just read out, um, is not ideal for your cabbage or your kale. And as far as pests go, aphids, cabbage worms, and leap loopers, uh, flea beetles, and harlequin bugs are all common pests to any of your brassicas. Um, so regular scouting underneath the leaves for eggs or nymphs or casings or droppings is going to be essential um, just to know what's going on so that you can catch these pests during their 
their best treatment stage. Generally speaking, the nymph stage is the best stage to catch any bug um, for treatments, but it's going to depend on the exact type of bug. And as, I, as it says on the bottom, their treatment will ultimately vary by pest. So with that, do we have any questions before we switch over to Chelsea? There was a question. Sure. What do you recommend if I don't use synthetic fertilizers? So if you don't use synthetic fertilizers, there are several types of um, organic fertilizers out there as well. Um, high nitrogen, I would have to pull that list up and get that to you, but I can for sure email that uh, in your direction. And I will post that um, in the notes as well with this recording. Share my screen. Okay. Oh, we're having a little bit of a One moment. All right. Okay, I'm now going to cover the nutritional piece of it. Um, so if you do have any other questions on the growing, just put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the the end of the uh, presentation here. But cabbage kale are really powerful produce. Um, and as we kind of come into March, March is National Nutrition Month. And as we come into that, it's really a good time to think about what are we consuming? Are we getting the most bang for our buck nutritionally? And so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into both of these, but they are powerful produce and definitely two of the vegetables that we should be consuming in our diet. So a couple dates to remember, we just unfortunately missed National Cabbage Day, uh, but National Cabbage Day is always celebrated February 17th, and then National Kale Day happens in the fall, and that is usually the first Wednesday in October. So why should you purchase cabbage? We're going to start with cabbage first. Um, the main thing is we have a couple different points here. A, that it's affordable. It is one of the produce that is usually pretty inexpensive. It does vary depending, of course, on the season. and But it can be as cheap as sometimes 40 cents a pound and then up to $1.30 or more. Um, there's a lot of variables that go into that. Like I said, if it's in season, um, in the store itself. Uh, of course, some cabbages like Napa are a little bit more expensive. So your green cabbage is going to usually be the most uh, inexpensive. Purple cabbage is usually relatively around that same amount, but our other cabbages um, like Napa, even kale is going to be a little bit more expensive. The other benefit is typically cabbage is found year round in the stores. It stores well, it is very intact. It's very hardy for transportation as well because of those dense heads. So usually it is available in your stores year round and you can find it either whole or pre-chopped. Of course, like anything, if you do buy the pre-chopped, you're going to have that higher price point, but there are tons of cabbage shredded in the stores. The storage life is also another great benefit of why you should purchase kale. Um, you typically want to store them unwashed and whole, uncut in a crisper door in an airtight container. Most of our produce, we usually want to store it unwashed and whole until we're ready to use this. A, this prevents oxygen from getting to the inside of the plant, which then degrades the vitamins and minerals, um, promotes obviously mold or degradation to happen a lot faster. So storing it unwashed and whole, it does store well for two months. If any of you have ever had cabbage in your refrigerator and you keep forgetting to use it and you go in and you realize, oh, this is still in great shape. So it does st store very, very well in your refrigerator, which makes it kind of a nice staple vegetable to have always on hand for those nights that you either don't have any other vegetables in your refrigerator or you can't think of something to make. It's just an easy thing. Again, your Napa and other um, cabbages are going to have a shorter life, but for the most part, they store all very well. Uh, a couple interesting things, the per capita consumption has actually declined over the last two decades. Uh, back in 2002, 
uh, the U.S. was consuming about 8.3 pounds per capita, and we're down to about 6.2 pounds per capita in 2022. So there is a decline, but again, this is really a, a kind of a powerhouse and an affordable, easy to store produce. Additionally, it's very nutritious. One cup of chopped cabbage only has about 22 calories, um, 2.2 grams of that should be fiber. And it also has a lot of vitamins and minerals. So when we look at the percentages, these are based on women, men and women will have different needs when it comes to calories, fiber, and their vitamin and mineral intakes. But for a woman, one cup of chopped uh, cabbage, and this is for, um, we're looking at purple, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the differences here in a minute, but about 68% of our vitamin C intake for the day, 8% of our potassium and 38% of our vitamin K. So there is a lot of nutrients in there. When we talk about green or that light colored cabbage, generally we have it ingrained in our head that the brighter the produce, the more beneficial it is for us, which is true to a certain extent. So when we look at a green cabbage versus a red cabbage, the red cabbage is going to be a little bit more healthier for us in terms of it has more antioxidants and it has a vitamin, higher vitamin content. Uh, again, that brighter color typically is associated with more antioxidants, more vitamins and more minerals. However, that doesn't mean that those lighter colored vegetables have no vitamins or minerals or no antioxidants at all. And this is considered a cruciferous vegetable. So those have been shown to lower inflammation. What's really important about eating produce is that most of our fruits and vegetables are going to be loaded with many different anthocyanins, antioxidants, and those are all going to help us lower inflammation. Chronic inflammation has been shown to contribute to heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, um, arthritis, all these different contributing factors that go into chronic disease and inflammation is definitely one of those. The other benefit of cabbage is it supports good gut health, um, specifically when we're looking at those that have been fermented, and that is our sauerkraut and our kimchi. The other great thing about cabbage is that it really does withstand all types of cooking. So there's some produce that is very heat sensitive. You, you lose a lot of the vitamins and minerals, or it just gets really the texture and the flavor doesn't hold up very well. But cabbage is one of those. You can boil it, roast it, braise it, steam, um, stir fries, even grilling. If you've ever, you can take and slice cabbage into kind of um, steaks, if you will. You can grill those for a nice flavor profile. And so it does hold up very well. The majority of cabbage, which probably isn't a surprise to many of you, is processed and used for coleslaw, about 45% of that. Um, then we have our fresh head cabbage makes up about 35%. Sauerkraut is 12%. And other fresh cut products is that 5 to 10%. The coleslaw is, is great and it's easy way to get your coleslaw or your cabbage in. The one consideration with coleslaw is obviously the dressing that goes on it. Typically they're high fat, they're um, loaded with a lot of calories, but there are some great ways for you to make your own homemade dressing to go with that coleslaw and makes it a little bit more nutritious for us. So when we talk about the differences between green, purple, red, the green obviously is the most popular. It's a very, it's a bit more abundant in grocery stores compared to your purple, red. It's used in salads, slaw, stir fries. And this is the most common one for sauerkraut. However, you can still use a uh, purple cabbage for sauerkraut. It has a slight peppery taste, but the benefit of when you cook it, it does get a little bit sweeter and less peppery. So having it in a raw salad, maybe some people don't like coleslaw because it's just kind of got that peppery but cooking it definitely makes it that a little more, a um, little less pungent and a little more tolerable to some people. The purple and red cabbage, it's pretty much can be used interchangeably with what recipes green cabbage goes into. But the one consideration is that that purple color will leach. If you've ever cooked with purple red cabbage before, you probably clearly know that. Um, the, the one thing of how you can combat that is that that anthocyanin leaks out, especially when it's cooked with alkaline substances. And so how you combat that leaching out or even turning a blue color, if you've had leftover food before, maybe that cabbage that you cooked is very bright purple when you eat it, but then the next day it turns that blue color. 
And that's because of that alkaline substances in it interacting with those anthocyanins. But the trick is to use an acid and it will keep that nice magenta shade. So you can either add an acid during the cooking process or maybe you forget and you can add an acid after the fact. And that will help to bring that magenta shade back in together. Um, we have then bok choy and napa, which Anthony kind of briefly touched on. The bok choy is mostly used in Chinese cooking. Um, it's frequently used in soup, salads, stir fries, and spring roll fillings, pot stickers, all those different things. It has a very mild flavor. And when it's especially stir fried with a sesame oil and a garlic, it really does enhance that natural mild sweet flavor of that bok choy. It can be braised or um, stewed. But unlike the other cabbage, the, the green head cabbage, this is really best if only exposed to short blast of high heat. So if you are sauteing or um, kind of using it in a stir fry, you wanna make sure that you don't overcook it because that does kind of destroy that freshness flavor and that texture that we like of the bok choy. For Napa or Chinese cabbage, um, it has that oblong shape. And this one typically goes well with salads because it has that mild flavor. Um, and then again, it's often used and prepared in specific cuisine. So you'll find that the Napa cabbage is mostly used in maybe those Asian dishes. Um, what's nice about this is this is a great one to use as kind of a, a wrapper, if you will. So you can typically take those leaves and fill them with a meat sauce or a meat dish or some other vegetables. And it holds up very well for that um, kind of wrap. And then fermented Napa cabbage um, can be used to create that kimchi. If you like kimchi, uh, I'm personally not a fan, but it does have, again, those great gut health benefits. So we talk about cabbage. You can dry cabbage, actually. It is categorized um, kind of as a fair drying vegetable, though. The problem is it readily absorbs moisture from the air. So if you dry, if you dry it and it's not stored well, it will absorb that moisture from the uh, air. And so with that, it really only keeps well if it's stored in also extremely cold temperatures. So drying may not be the best option depending on your situation, but you can dry it. And so kind of the directions for drying is there. You would just want to make sure that you're slicing it into about one eighth inch strips, blanching it. So the blanching process, we always want to blanch typically our vegetables before we dry them. It kills the enzymes that keep that product degrading down. And so that'll help to keep that product last a lot longer. And then the drying times are there. The drying times may vary depending upon your type of dehydrator that you're using. And of course, um, definitely find a suitable reference for the proper temperature to use. Freezing. You know, cabbage really doesn't freeze the best. It is best consumed raw or cooked because after it's frozen, it does kind of get that thawed, limp, waterlogged. Um, it quickly develops an oxidized color and also has an off aroma and flavor typically. However, that's not to say that you can't freeze cabbage. If you are freezing cabbage, you'll just want to note that you're only really going to be, be able to use it as a cooked vegetable in dishes. Um, the instructions say there, there, you'll do pretty similar to the drying where you're going to remove those outer leaves, um, slice it into one eighth inch thick strips, Blanch it, still same thing. You're going to cool drain and then package. And whenever we do freezing, we always want to leave a little bit of a headspace because as things freeze, they're going to expand. So to prevent any type of a bag or jar from breaking, you want to make sure you're leaving that proper headspace. Sauerkraut. Uh, sauerkraut, again, is one of those kind of uh, underutilized, underrecognized produce uh, or how you can use a produce. Sauerkraut has great gut health benefits and in the news and kind of the research has really shown the importance of having good gut health and good bacteria in your gut health. And so here's kind of the directions of how to do it. You can, again, find these online using a reputable source. Um, we have some information on our K-State extension page as well. But typically five pounds of cabbage will about will equal about two one quart jars. And you'll do your normal process of canning. You'll sterilize your jars. And you're going to use about five pounds of cabbage to about three and a half tablespoons of canning salt. And you really want to make sure you have that canning salt because it is best for any canning or sauerkraut making. Um, you're going to shred it. And the key here is that you're going to make sure that you're just kind of massaging that salt and cabbage together in a large bowl. 
And you're going to keep doing that until the cabbage is wilted, which is about 10 minutes, to, depending um, at how really massaging and how much you're overturning that produce that's in there. And it's going to help to dry out that liquid. So you're going to keep massaging and you're going to keep squeezing the cabbage until it really becomes soft and the juices accumulate in the bottom of the bowl. You're going to then package the cabbage into your jars and you're going to pour that remaining liquid into the jar. Sometimes you may not have enough juice to cover the whole cabbage and you really do need to make sure that all the cabbage is covered with the liquid. And so you can just kind of create your own brine and so you'll just boil some water and some canning salt to add to it. There are, I unfortunately forgot to bring my jar. I had, I had a jar at home that I was going to bring. Um, you can really use any type of, um, any type of equipment, but the ball brand has this really nice sauerkraut making kit. And so basically you're going to have a quart jar. It comes with a spring and it comes with a plastic lid top that has air vents in it to help the, the bubbles and air circulate out. And so it is really kind of convenient if you like to make to make small batch sauerkraut. Now, if you're making a big batch, big batch of sauerkraut, then that's probably might not be the best um, tool or avenue for you to, to can and to use it that way, but you can find those at most stores. When you do have the fermentation process, you wanna make sure that that container is stored between about 70 to 75 degrees. Um, if it is this temperature, the sauerkraut would be fully fermented in about three to four weeks. If the temperature is below that, it may take a little bit longer. And if it's even, if it's really cold, if you keep it out in your garage or something like that, especially during the winter, the sauerkraut may not ferment. And then if it's a hot and it's above 80, it actually may become too spoiled. So if you do small batch fermentation, it can be stored for months in the refrigerator. You can freeze it, or you can then take it one step further and water bath can that sauerkraut. So there's kind of a reference for you if you want to learn more and to get the specifics for the fermentation of sauerkraut. Here's just another recipe, um, you know, experimenting with spices, sauerkraut, or excuse me, cabbage itself doesn't have a lot of flavor, but what's nice about it is it really does hold up well to using a different variety of spices and herbs. So here we have cabbage with cumin seeds and turmeric. Um, so we have some other health benefits. Turmeric is a great antioxidant and has a lot of other health benefits for us. So incorporating that into our dishes. Moving on to kale. So talking about kale, again, it's one of those that usually is available year round in stores. You can find it whole. Um, sometimes whole isn't quite as available depending on the time of year or they do have pre-chopped bags of kale usually in the salad where the other pre-chopped salad bags are. It is the most nutritious type of cabbage and the dark kind of green crinkled leaves, they really do have a lot of nutrients, a lot of nutrients and nutrition in them. The nice thing about kale as well is that it is a heartier leafy green vegetable compared to if we think about our spinach, um, our romaine lettuces. So it can withstand a lot of types of cooking as well, similar to cabbage, boiling, roasting, braising, steaming, stir frying. Um, and sometimes people discard the stem because they don't think that the stems are edible and they are harder, but they are great and they can be cooked and they still have a lot of that nutrition in them. So you can either cook them to make them soft and palatable or what's great is you can keep them and use it for a vegetable stock. They're a great addition to add if you're making your own homemade vegetable stock. A fun fact is Thomas Jefferson was a kale lover. He actually had several different varieties of kale that was grown in his um, home and gardens in the early 1800s. So purchasing kale, uh, one cup of chopped kale is also very nutritious. It has low calorie, fiber, and a lot of vitamins and minerals. It is high in antioxidants, which we have talked about in the previous um, slides about with kale or with cabbage, that it is used to reduce inflammation. The other interesting thing about kale is that it may help bind bile acids, which then ultimately helps lower cholesterol levels. And so there were some studies that were done. Um, these are a little bit older studies, but consuming kale had been shown that it may help reduce cholesterol levels from that binding bile acids. 
Some people hate raw kale. I hear this quite often. Oh, I don't like the taste of it or the texture of it. And so a lot of people will tend to avoid it. Um, if you are going to eat it raw or in a salad, there are a few methods that you can use to help make it a little bit more palatable and to soften those leaves to make it easier to chew and less bitter. So the first thing is basically you need to give it a nice massage. And so you place the leaves in the bowl and you drizzle it with a little oil. And really you need to massage those leaves for about one to two minutes or a little bit longer, but really about that two minutes, depending on how much kale you're working with. And you really want to massage the leaves and kind of work that oil into the leaves. And that helps to let, soften them and to make them a little bit easier to chew. The other thing is you can just quickly blanch those leaves in a pot of boiling water for about a minute. Um, it's not enough to make them soft and to fully cook them, but it's just enough to kind of help remove some of that bitter flavor from kale. And then you can dry it and then put it in your salad or whatever you're using in the raw form. And then you can also soften kale using a lemon or another acidic ingredient like an apple cider vinegar. Drying, um, you know, I was actually surprised with this one that it's categorized as poor for drying. Um, I do personally think it holds up pretty well. So there's the directions for how to dehydrate and dry it. What I think is interesting is on the store shelves right now, you'll find a lot of those green powders or even on other online platforms where you can purchase, but you can really make your own green powders. It's basically just vegetables that have been dehydrated and then pulverized into powder form. So by pulverizing, drying your kale and pulverizing it, some people will add kale or spinach to smoothies. Kale personally adds a little bit more of a texture to smoothies. So if you still kind of want a little bit of those nutritional benefits, you can definitely dry kale and kind of create your own powder that you then would add to your smoothies or to whatever you are consuming. Freezing. Freezing is um, a better way to preserve leafy vegetables like kale compared to canning for long-term storage. Um, again, it's typically best consumed raw or cooked, but the, the kale does hold up a little bit better um, than with the cabbage. And so you can freeze it. Just know that again, same thing, you're going to have to use it in a cooked product and it is suitable though for freezing. Here is a recipe. This um, uses the dinosaur kale, the Tuscan kale, has chickpeas, has some cheese, red pepper flakes, fennel seeds. And so this is another great way to incorporate lots of different foods and flavors into one dish. And then the other common thing that people will do, you can buy these at the store, um, but you can also make your own is kale chips. And so kale chips is basically kale that you take, tear it into small pieces, put a little bit of oil on them, and then put them in the oven at a low heat and it's going to kind of make them a little bit crunchy. I'm not going to compare them to potato chips because they're not at all like a potato chip, but they do have a little bit of a different texture. They have a little bit of a crunch to them and they're a great snack that are going to be nutritious, low calorie, and um, quite tasty. A couple things, people sometimes ch struggle to make their own kale chips. And really the key is not to add too much oil because if you add too much oil, then the kale doesn't really have a time to crisp up because it's kind of waterlogged with that oil and it's not gonna crisp up like you want it to. The other thing is there are a lot of different recipes out there and each oven kind of varies with how hot it is. Um, if you have a convection oven, which circulates the heat a little bit more than a conventional oven, that will play a factor as well. So really you need to make sure that you're watching the kale kale chips and figure out what is the best time and cooking for your specific oven. The other two points is to keep it in a single layer. You don't want to overlap them because then it doesn't allow that air to circulate all around them for even cooking and for that Christmas. And then to don't over bake. Um, sometimes we think brown in, in most fruits and vegetables when they get kind of that brown caramelized color, it's actually a little bit of a sweeter color. But in this instance, um, brown equals bitter. So if you get your kale chips too brown, they're going to have a bitter taste. And so they're not going to be as great. So there's a kind of a, a recipe that hopefully you'll try at home. And in terms of storing them, 
Um, you do want to store them air in an airtight tight container so that they stay crisp because if they're exposed to oxygen, they'll kind of uh, absorb that moisture that's in that air. And with that, are there any questions, comments? Um, I would love to hear if you guys have any ways that you also cook kale or cabbage. So mine is the awesome. favorite. Well, um, our contact information is there. So if you do think of any questions or comments, concerns that you want to share with us, we are happy to answer them for you. And next month we will be doing beans. So stay tuned for that one. And thank you all for joining and watching the recording online.